Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Happy Wednesday. I'm sending a big virtual cheers from me to you. Thank you for being here today. If you're new here, welcome. We love new friends and we love new connections. So if you haven't already, one of these days, I'll figure out where to point. But until then, <laughs> please drop in the chat. Uh, say hi. Let us know where you're coming in from and maybe what's in your cup as long as it's non-alcoholic. If I don't know, I can't get you in trouble. So maybe don't maybe don't spill the, the tea on that. But uh, really excited for you to be here. If you're new here, as I said, welcome. This is a fun space. We get together every single Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern to talk to interesting experts, founders, VCs, anyone that is going to help us get ahead and shortcut our lives to find the fastest way to be better, which is why it's my favorite meeting every single week because we're all together and we're all learning from each other. And let's be honest, we're copying the homework of these experts because we're all adults now and there's no teachers to get us in trouble. So we're going to, we're going to go ahead and copy. I'm very excited for today's expert to join us because I have a feeling we're going to do a lot of copying off her homework today. She is such a rock star. If you haven't already, please do a little clicking. We'll drop the link in the chat. Oh, where's the chat? We'll drop the link in the chat uh, for Stacey A. Gordon. She is fantastic, not only a complete rock star expert in her field, but she is a fellow LinkedIn learning instructor with one of the highest watch courses ever, like in the history of courses, like really freaking amazing. And she's here to let us in on a little secret that um, she has a book coming out at the end of the month, which I'm also really excited about. I'm calling it now. It's going to be a New York Times bestseller. I'm doing it. I'm putting that out into the universe because that's just going to happen. So please, wherever you are in the world, help me in welcoming Stacy to coffee with us. Hello. Hello. Hi, Stacey. How are you? I am wonderful. How are you? I am I'm doing pretty great. I got my tea in hand. I'm excited to talk to you. It's, and it's another great Wednesday. Yes, it's a rainy Wednesday here in Los Angeles, which is not usual. Not usual. And if I remember correctly, no one knows how to drive in rain in Los Angeles. So I remember the city just being like empty the minute you saw like one raindrop. You can just say no one knows how to drive in Los Angeles and that'll be accurate. <laughs> you said it. I didn't say it. <laughs> I said it. Come for me if you want. <laughs> I love it. Well, I'm so excited for you to be here today. And I, as I said, I wanted everybody to kind of Google stalk you a little bit for, but if somebody didn't have time to Google stalk you before jumping on here today, what is like the grand overview of who Stacy is and what the heck she does? I am, uh, gosh, who am I? So I am a unconscious bias expert. And I, I take that back. I don't like to say unconscious bias expert. It's really about diversity, equity, and inclusion. But the thing that I talk about a lot is unconscious bias because it underlines um, a lot of our behaviors in the workplace and in life. And so the, as you said, the course uh, that I did on LinkedIn um, is available on LinkedIn Learning, which a lot of people I've realized don't know about, which is so astounding to me. I'm like, how do you not know that LinkedIn has these great learning opportunities for you to take these courses? I know you've heard of Coursera and Udemy, but LinkedIn has their own learning platform. Um, I mean, they kind of stole it from lynda.com, but well, they bought it. They bought it, right? They purchased lynda.com. <laughs> but many people didn't know about lynda.com either. So I might be telling people two new things. Um, <laughs> so the unconscious bias course, I mentioned it because it's free right now. So that's always, the big thing I'm saying is before the end of the month, before the end of March, take advantage, you know, stop in, uh, check your biases, right? Uh, well, listen, you're speaking my language because if there's any price tag I love, it's free 99. Like if something is free 99, whether it's a course or pizza, like I'm there. Yes, the pizza sounds great, but um, yes. <laughs> like ready to go when it comes to free, that's for sure. And how many courses, you've done several courses with LinkedIn, it's not just I one. Have four. Yes, yes, I have four on their platform. And so 
Two are around diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? The first, like I said, is the unconscious bias course, which, by the way, has also been translated into four languages. So if you speak Portuguese or Spanish or Japanese or Mandarin, you can watch it in your native language. Um, and so I love, that this. I love this so much because when I checked out your course and that's how I found you, what I really loved is sometimes, and I don't know if you experienced this with some of like the clients and the Fortune 500 companies that you work with, but sometimes when I, I feel like we're talking about diversity and inclusion, um, singular people, like just individuals are like, well, I'm not a boss or I don't own the company. I'm not the CEO, so I can't really make a difference because I'm like low man on the totem pole and you know nobody reports to me. And what I think is so interesting is I feel like you're really giving away nuggets that people can do sort of in their everyday lives, regardless as you know, they, they might not be the CEO of a Fortune 500 company. Right. And that's the thing, right? I mean, so I'll finish answering your first question first, right? Which was how many courses? So there's an unconscious bias course. There is a diversity recruiting course. Uh, so for all of you talent acquisition folks, hiring managers, right? Um, the diversity recruiting course is there as well. And then for the individuals, right? If you're just looking for your own self um, edification and uh, you're trying to catapult your career, I have a course on writing a resume and I have one on making a career change. Um, and you might think, well, that's strange to have, those are two very separate things. And I say, no, they're not at all, right? It's part of a 360 degree view of work uh, because we have to get our acts together and make sure that our resumes are together and that we know what we want. And we have to choose workplaces that work for us. You can't choose a workplace that works for you if you're sitting in the wrong career. <laughs> Right. You have got to think how many of you out there right now, hands up are going, oh, my God, I hate my job. I don't know how I fell into this career and I want to change, but I don't know how. Right. So in order to have workplaces that work for everyone, you have to get out of that job that you hate so that somebody who loves it can take your place. <laughs> right. As an employer, that's what I would want. I want somebody who loves the job to be in the seat because then we're going to work together better they're going to work harder for the company they they align with our mission vision values right if you don't align with your company's mission vision values, you don't even know what they are probably <laughs> right you probably yeah, like don't have a website that. somewhere yeah and it happened don't even have it on their website they forgot what it is they have to like dust off a handbook somewhere uh to dig it out and find out what it is well, and so, I was talking about it on LinkedIn earlier this week, you know, interviewing, it's a two way street. You know, I know a lot of people right now are interviewing for new jobs or looking to get hired. And it's just not someone, it's not like the bachelor where you're like waiting to get picked, like, oh, give me the rose. You know, you bring a lot to the table too. So when you're thinking about interviewing, it's also your, you know, is this the right fit for you? Not just, right. are, are they wanting to pick you? Right. And the only way you know if it's the right fit for you is if you know what you really want to do, right? You have to get clear on your goals and what you're trying to do in your life and what you're trying to accomplish. Then you can get clear on what kind of company is going to help you to achieve those goals. But if you don't know, this is why you just keep falling around from place to place to place and you're just accepting a job because you need the money. And hey, I get that, right? You got to pay your bills. So the one thing I tell people is, please understand you cannot make a career change in the middle. Of, like if you're unemployed and need a job, please go get a job, right? Go get a job, any job that's going to put food on your table. This is not the time to be picky. But you get to be picky once you have, you know, created that level set and you have um, your study in what you're doing then you can have the conversation with yourself and go, okay, what do I really want to be doing, right? And then you have time on your hands. Um, not necessarily you have a lot of time, but I mean, you have an opportunity to take your time and really craft the job that you want instead of settling for the job you can get. Well, and I think it's so funny when you're looking for the job you want, that I always say to people as well, it can look like your dream job on paper. And you're like, yes, it's the title I want. It's the responsibilities I want. It's the salary I want. And then you get there and maybe it's you're looking at the people or maybe you're like, oh, 
like this is not the culture maybe, or this is not the vibe, whatever word you want to use for energy, I don't know, whatever word, you realize that you're sort of like not a fit. Because it's happened to me. I ended up somewhere where, which on paper looked great. I got there and I was like, oh, I should have asked more questions. I should have asked more questions about how our decisions made, how, you know, who gets a seat at the table. Because once I got there and kind of saw the unwritten culture that was going on, I was like, oh no, unsubscribe. I made a mistake. <laughs> right. Right. And then at that point, it's hard because you don't want to leave right away because it's like, well, then I'm going to be a job hopper. Oh, you know, right. Heaven forbid, right. That you've had four jobs in four years that somehow makes you less experienced or less qualified. I'm not sure who came up with that rule. right? But I, I think it's ridiculous. And so you have to be careful about where you're going to put your butt. Right. Like what where are you putting that butt in a seat in what company? What do they do? So Googling them and looking at who are they? How do they treat people? What do they do? Um, you know, yeah, Glassdoor reviews, but also remembering that reviews, people only review stuff if they really hate it or they really like it. <laughs> so there's a huge bell curve in the middle of people who have nothing to say, right? So just taking what you find on the internet with a grain of salt, <laughs> Right. And knowing that you really have to do, you know, your own due diligence and your own research. I mean, LinkedIn, I think, is another great platform to reach out to people that maybe work at that company or have worked at that company to say, like, what's the real deal here? I think like that's another kind of good, good tip and trick. I heard you on a podcast and it like blew my mind. You said that not only obviously are you on LinkedIn and, and putting out amazing content every day, but that you personally respond to every single LinkedIn connection request or message in your inbox. That is a lot. It has, so it's a whole feat. So it's no longer me personally anymore because it has gotten out of control. It's like, it is insane. Um, I think right now I've got about 300 requests waiting. And it's always like we go through and we answer 50 and it's like, oh, we've got 60 more. It's like the more we answer, more. the more. We have. Um, but I do. I do go in and I read them. Uh, my assistant helps me respond to all of them. Um, and I, I, I try my best. So it's really luck of the draw because I wake up on a Sunday morning and that's usually I just pick up my phone and start like responding to people. And so whether or not you get an actual response from me just depends upon how far you are down in the queue and how far I got that morning. So sometimes what are, I like, what are the most common questions that you're sort of getting people, whether they're kind of texting it to you on a LinkedIn message or maybe just with your clients that you're working with on an everyday basis? Like what kind of comes up the most? Oh, what comes up the most? Um, you know, I think that... So oh, I just had a conversation yesterday. I will not name who this conversation was with, or I won't even, it just, it was an interesting conversation that I had to have with a group of individuals uh, because of a specific incident that happened. And so I was brought in to have the uncomfortable conversation, right? It's like, I gotta have the uncomfortable conversation. Um, and in that conversation, it was interesting to see the different perspectives of people. And so what we really got to was the fact that the incident went over the head of many people because it wasn't directed at them, right? Or one of their dimensions of diversity. So they didn't really notice it. And what I had to get them to understand was had that been directed at you, right? Or a dimension of diversity that you recognized, you would have noticed it. But it went over your head because it didn't personally affect you. And so I think the number one thing that I get is most people, because it doesn't personally affect them, they don't pay attention to it. And, um, and I get a lot of people who say, well, this isn't actually happening. You don't know what you're talking about. You're just stirring things up, right? You're you know, stirring up trouble where there isn't any, right? And it's like, I wish that was the case, <laughs> but it's really not. I swear it is not my job to go around uh, making people upset all day, right? And so it, it's just the idea that we are finally in a space where people feel emboldened to actually say that they are being insulted or degraded 
or not promoted, right, or unfairly targeted, more and more of that is happening, whereas before people just suffered in silence. So it's like, I'm sorry that you would prefer that groups of people suffer in silence so that you can be comfortable. Well, and I think I feel like you hit on such a good point. I, I have like a two prong question, so you can like pick where you want to go with it. But you bring up a good point, which is sometimes people don't notice. So that's sort of like bias coming in where you don't even realize like that unconscious bias that's happening. So my first question is how how can you become aware of this invisible thing that you don't even know you might have? Like, is there a quiz, <laughs> certain online test somewhere that you you know you can take? Like, what yes, does that look like? And then secondly, <laughs> like I, I really would love you to touch on because I think this gets confused a lot. Is the difference between bias and discrimination? Because I feel like sometimes those get used yes. interchangeably, and they're yes. different. My memory is terrible, so I'm going to start with the first one. And if I don't get to the second one, please remind me, <laughs> right? Um, but I think the the unconscious part is I, like I've I literally have been watching arguments on the internet, right? When I post something and I mention unconscious bias, somebody else will come in and go, "Well, if you're unconscious, you're dead." So this is stupid. This isn't the definition, right? And then people are posting definitions of what unconscious actually means and and I'm just sitting back, right? Like the popcorn, like the, the like the meme, right? Janet, what is it? If Michael Jackson with the popcorn, I'm just like, "All right, let me let me see how this plays out." <laughs> because there's a, you have to understand so I'll say this first too. I'm always asking, does it really matter, right? Whether we call it unconscious bias, implicit bias, conscious bias, whatever you wanna call it. Can we all agree though that it exists, right? So whether I wanna call it supercalifragilistic, hbalidocious, right? Are we really gonna sit here and have a, a conversation over semantics or are we gonna tackle the problem? And you don't want to tackle the problem because that's too much work. So you'd rather spend time trying to, uh, you know, um, really, what's that word? You're trying to, 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 I can't think of the word. What is the word? Oh my God. They're just trying to, 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 to ignore it, right? So like to skate over it and to really not have to go deep, stay surface level. And so the best way for them to do that is by focusing on the wording rather than what we actually mean, right? So then the idea of that is, okay, here we go, that here's the actual problem, right? Unconscious bias, let's think about, okay, are you breathing right now? Yes. Okay, do you walk around saying, breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out, right? Do you do that? Absolutely not. Well, only when I'm really nervous. Right, or if you're meditating, right? But do we have to do that in order to be aware of the fact that we are breathing? Right, we're aware that this is happening. So it's the same thing, right? So to get to this place where we can, so yes, right, let me first say, we can be conscious of something and um, of that is unconscious, right? Because part of that is once somebody has really brought it to your attention, then you go, oh, this is something that happens. Okay, let me learn more, right? Let me find out a little bit more about that rather than call me an idiot and say that, you know, you're a moron, you don't know what you're talking about because, you know, right? <laughs> so the second part of that is when we look at how do you interrupt it, um, you have to, the, the way that that happens is by the awareness, right? By understanding that this happens. So, and the, the, the difference between then unconscious bias and discrimination is the act. So if I say, and this has happened, um, I am, uh, and I've been using this example because it's a true example, it happened. Um, one of the consultants that I work with and I, we were with a client in San Francisco, gosh, it's over a year ago now, and we were at their office. We had our laptops up, we were trying to get them connected and we couldn't get connected to the client's you know, Wi-Fi. So someone said, oh, someone from IT will come and help you. So somebody from IT came to help us but it was a woman that showed up, right? So afterwards we were talking about it and um, and it was like, oh wow, yeah. It, it kind of really got to me that it, it just, it triggered for a moment, right? Because you were expecting the IT guy, right? We even say the IT guy, there's a reason yeah. they're called the IT guy and not the IT girl, right? 
So now, did we say, oh, I'm sorry, we need a guy, right, from IT. I'm not going to work with a girl. That would be discrimination, right? And some people, and people have done that. People would say, oh, there's no way people would do that. Um, how many times has a Black person been in a store ready to help somebody and somebody has said, I don't want that person to help me. I want somebody else to help me. Or they're in a hospital and a Black doctor walks in, right? Or a female doctor walks in or a young doctor. I've seen this too. This person's too young. They couldn't possibly be you know, experienced enough to take care of me. I need an older doctor, <laughs> right? These are the things that we do. So uh, I think that the act is the difference. We can think it, it's gonna happen, right? And when we think it, we have to go, ah, I just thought that, that wasn't cool. But we don't have to say it, we don't have to let it leave our mouth and we don't have to act upon it. Are there any like online, you know, tests or quizzes or something that you can like, I don't know, are there like scores and how far along you are in like the process of noticing? I wanna say, Yes, but there shouldn't be. <laughs> like, so there's the, the Harvard um, uh, Implicit Association Test, right, which has been used, I want to say, since the 70s now. Uh, but nothing else has really been created, right? And the problem with the Harvard IAT, you can literally Google Harvard IAT and it will pop up. I think the last time I checked, like 17 million people have taken this test, right? But the, the idea with this is that, and they've expanded, they've got a bunch of them now. And you are supposed to go in and you're supposed to associate, you know, different, different uh, things that will pop up on the screen. But my issue with it is how you have to take it. And so it's not intuitive. So you're using keys on a keyboard that make you have to think. And in the time it takes you to think about, well, wait, I want to pick that picture, but which key is it? right? It makes it seem as though you've paused. So I feel like it puts in additional, maybe because of the way you have to take it, it doesn't really capture uh, your true thoughts on it. But that doesn't make it bad because I go back to awareness. Um, it's about awareness. Take it as something fun, something to think about, because the things that will pop up will make you think, right? So you can have a conversation about it. It's not about getting a score at the end, right? It's about taking it and seeing what types of, of images are they comparing? What, how do I feel when I looked at these images? And to start to have some self-reflection about who we are as people. Um, the second thing is I do have an assessment um, that I created and it's just a mini one really for corporations to kind of help people figure out where they might be, where their company is along the spectrum. So we start with awareness, we go to alignment, you get to action and then to advocacy. And so when you take the, the what I call it a little blueprint, and, and really I use that blueprint and it's part of what's in my book, right? It it's, comes off of that, um, that framework um, to really understand that most companies, especially after last year, they wanted to jump into action. They wanted to do something. And I'm like, that's great that you want to do something, but who are you doing it for? What are you doing? Why are you doing it, right? These are questions that need to be uh, answered before you start to get to action, which is why we have to go back to this awareness phase and really be aware of the things that are happening within your workplace. You have to actually talk to your employees. You need to find out uh, what they need because you come to me and say, Stacy, we, we need unconscious bias training. And my answer is always, do you? I mean, you probably do, <laughs> right? But probably do. you don't know that for a fact, right? And I'm not gonna work off of an assumption that that's what you need because maybe you do need that, but maybe you need something else first, right? So that's the thing is looking at what do you actually need and really using facts, measurements, data, to decide what to do rather than gut feel and like, oh, so let me see which way the wind is blowing today. <laughs> well, and I feel like what's interesting, I always think is really interesting about your work and also any type of work, I would actually say in a weird way, I'd ask the same question to like a trainer because people are coming to you knowing they're, that you're about to make them uncomfortable 
and you're going to push them. It's like going to a trainer and they're going to make you do 20 burpees. And you're like, I don't want to do the burpees. And this is probably going to hurt, but like, it's going to make me better after I do the burpees. Like you are having people come to you going, Oh, Stacy, like I'm going to do this work and it's going to make me uncomfortable. And how do you approach someone who's like, okay, well, I'm a little scared. Like the thought of being uncomfortable is scary to me. Yeah. Nobody wants to be uncomfortable. Um, and I would say that you have to get over it. <laughs> right. I mean, and, um, it, it, it's it's very not, um, I, I'm, I'm originally, well, not originally, but I consider myself a New Yorker, right? I lived in New York for many years. And uh, when I, I used to do career coaching and, um, and I would always say career coaching because really I was a strategist. I'm like, you come to me, we talk about what you need to do. I help you figure out a plan, you go do, right? We're not gonna talk about your feelings. I'm gonna be honest, I don't care, right? I want to know what it is that you need to do to get you to the next step in your career and how can we create a plan to get you there, right? So I worked with this one lady who was very sort of fragile, ego, emotional, and she would always cry and she'd go, Stacy, you just don't, you just, you know, tell it like it is. And I'm like, yeah, because you got work to do. I need you to stop crying, put on your big girl panties and let's get to work. Right? Unless I'm going to have to find you somebody else to work with because I'm not here to worry about your feelings. And so I think it's the same with the clients I work with. And I'm not harsh, right? I'm not yelling at people. I'm not one of the, what is that, CrossFit, right? Give me, your, give me 10, <laughs> right? We're not doing that. <laughs> um, but it's, it's, it's more like physical therapy, <laughs> right? <laughs> you go to your physical therapist. They're nice to you. They help you. They're trying to rehabilitate you. <laughs> I'm curious, like I, you've obviously been doing this for years and years, rework work, which by the way, love that freaking name. So great. What are like the common things that you see that people are either most scared of or need the most help with, where you kind of walk into a client and you're like, I'm already sh like 90% sure that you're gonna need X, Y, Z. People just need help having the conversations. People are so scared to open their mouths and say something. And I really, I hate the fact that we have now taken the, the, the topic of DEI and aligned it with being, you know, uh, needing to be politically correct or if, if being too political. And I'm like, those two things have nothing to do with each other. Like, how did we get here, right? Like, we, <laughs> it's not about censorship. It's not about, you know, people walking around on eggshells and having to be cautious about what they say. Um, and, I, and the way that we get around that is by building relationships with people, right? We have to build relationships. We've gotta be better about the way that we treat people. But what we wanna do, and this is where the privilege comes in, right? Because for some of us, we've been in a state of privilege where we can walk around and do what we want and say what we want to whoever we want, whenever we want, right? It's now like, well, wait, you can't do that. It's like teaching a teenager who should have been taught manners when they were two and three years old, right? Should have been taught to say please and thank you. And now they're like 19 and 20 and no one ever told them that you actually need to say please and thank you. And they're like, well, what the hell for? Never had to do it before. It's like, yeah, it's not my fault that somebody didn't teach you <laughs> the right thing back then, right? I can't, I, I can't overcome that, right? We're, but we're here now. And you have to learn this today. So let's get to work. I I love that example. But I also, I totally hear you on, you know, really having to work with people and say, let's have the conversation. Like, let's sit here and do this because, and I'm curious what like Jen and Jeff and, and everybody else think, but like being uncomfortable, like sitting in discomfort, I'm curious what everybody thinks of that. Cause I know for me personally, I'm, uh, I'm like actively working on it. I'm a people pleaser. I'm an Enneagram three. I love when everyone's like happy. And like, so when anything is uncomfortable, I immediately go into like fix it mode. I'm like, we don't like discomfort, like fix, fix, fix. Whereas my fiance can totally sit in discomfort. And in, it's almost like he's like Zen. He's like, this is uncomfortable. We're going to be like having these conversations or doing this thing. 
And he's Zen. And meanwhile, my heart is like thudding out of my chest when it comes to discomfort. Like, yeah. I mean, you must see so many different personality types as well with, with how people can handle things like that. You have to sit in it, right? You do have to sit in it a little bit. And I think that that's where then psychological safety comes in. So that's why all these themes, they're all so important um, because when you talk about psychological safety, you are creating a space where it's okay to say, okay, this is uncomfortable. Like even when I'm doing an education session and I ask for feedback and I get nothing, I'll wait. And then I'll actually say, I can wait. <laughs> I can wait, right? I'll sit here in the uncomfortable silence until somebody says something. It's so right? true. Like, the silence is it's like, even I'm sure many of you are like, there's silence right now. <laughs> it's like, but it's, it's okay. And so you have to practice that. And as for a team, you have to say, we are going to do this as a team. And so then we can support each other. But when you're off by yourself, it's harder, right? But if we all say together, like, all right, we're gonna do this. So we can handle some discomfort. It's gonna be all right. This is a safe space. So if I'm doing something that you don't like, I want you to tell me, right? And I want you to understand, I might get a little frustrated at first, but then you're gonna remind me, right? That, hey, safe space, we're having this conversation. Like we gotta do the give and take and, and understand that just because we said, oh, we're gonna have a safe space, doesn't mean that if you tell me that I did something to tick you off, I'm not gonna get defensive. Right, because that's my first reaction. But give me a minute <laughs> to remember, like, okay, that's right, we, we are doing this. Uh, okay, let me regroup, I apologize. I did not mean to be defensive. <laughs> Can you say that again? Let me hear you this time, right? Like you, but it, you have to practice it, you gotta do it. And so that's the work that has to happen. We've gotta create these relationships with one another. And I tell people all the time, you think that you have a relationship with your coworker because you work together. You don't have a relationship. I don't even know why they call it a working relationship because it's not. You don't, you have not created a relationship. You are two people who happen to be in the same place working on content or whatever it is you're working on, right? But you have to have, start to actually have conversations to each, with each other. When you ask, how was your day? You actually need to wait for a response and really care about the response and not be like, hey, Jim, how was your day? As he's walking the other direction, you're like, okay, cool, whatever. Well, absolutely, you really have to create space for that dialogue, active listening, all these things that really create a rich relationship with not only the people you work with, but the other people at your company. And I'm curious with the book, which by the way, I'll plug again, is coming out later this month, um, do you have like templates or frameworks that people can, I don't want to say steal, but like borrow that you've kind of set up as like baby steps that people can do? Yeah. I mean, so one of the things we do is especially around handling microaggressions, um, is we have a framework that we use for that. And I think that understanding, um, part of that is, is first being able to, to realize that you can come back to, to the injustice, to the whatever it is that happened at, later, right? So the first thing that happens is somebody says something, you don't like it, you go, ooh, and you don't know how to respond in the moment. And so you let it go. And then you stew about it, right? For days and days, I can't believe she said that. How that Kim person can't believe, who does she think she is, right? And you're just stewing and stewing and stewing. And Kim has no idea, right? Kim is just often like, oh yeah, no clue, right? So learning that it's okay to come back and say, a couple days later and say, you know, Kim, during our conversation, you said X. Could you elaborate on what you meant by that? Because I might've taken it the wrong way, but it would help if you could explain, right? or to say, this is how it landed for me. Was that what you meant, right? And to give the person an opportunity first to understand that, yeah, I'm, an, I'm frustrated with this, but I'm not angry right now. I'm just letting you know, this is how I felt. This is how it came across to me. And I'm giving you an opportunity to explain yourself, right? So, and to clarify, 
what your point was because your point may well have been to insult me. Okay, fine. That's cool. I just need to know. <laughs> right. I love that you said that you can come back a few days later because I feel like I'm one of those people that, you know, I always have those friends that always have like the quick witty thing to say, like a comeback or something. And I'm like the awkward person that two days later is like, Oh, I just thought of a comeback <laughs> like right now. But like, it's already too late. Like the moment, the right. moment to do the comeback line has passed. Right. But the comeback, the quick witty comeback is also not constructive. Right. Right. It's also escalating. Right. So that's also not the right response. Um, and so as much as fun as it sounds and as satisfying as it feels to be like, <laughs> right, and give a, a snappy comeback, uh, you know, there is, there is a better way. <laughs> and so neither of those two extremes are really the way that you wanna go. Right, oh no, definitely not. But you know what, what, in, what makes me so excited about your book is that you call it an action manual, which we have to talk about this for a second because I read that and I was like, oh, brilliant. Like, why don't more people market their books as action manuals? Because I, that immediately to me says, I can take action and I have a manual, like a car manual. Like I know how to fix something because there is a manual. Like, so how did you come up with that? It's so smart, it's so genius. Thank you. Um, you know, it, it really is about the fact that people want to take action, right? They, that's what they want. And I always feel bad because I'm like, well, I don't want you to do that just yet, right? I need you to kind of reel it back a bit. Um, and so that's really what the book does is helps people to bring it back and to think through some of these things that they're doing. Because the example, I think I use this example in the book, um, is with uh, Starbucks, former CEO, um, Howard Schultz, right? And I love this example because it's funny. Um, but he, and it's funny, not funny, because of the reason it came about was when Eric Gardner got killed, I think it was 2017, in like Staten Island, you know, it was another one of these, these moments where it was like, oh my goodness, we have to do something. We need to talk about race. And he was absolutely right. We do need to do something we do need to talk about race. Uh, but you need to have a strategy for that, right? So his plan was, it was called the uh, Race Together campaign. And what he wanted to do, he had his baristas, they were supposed to like write like, I don't know, questions or things that are on the coffee cup for people so they could have these conversations with each other, right? And so I, the thing I loved the most was a tweet from a New Yorker who said, if somebody tries to engage me in a race conversation before I've had my morning coffee, it is not gonna go well. <laughs> and I just always remember that, like, because I was like, that is hilarious and it's accurate. And it just shows that he had no, he didn't equip these baristas to be able to have this conversation. You're trying to get them to what, have uncomfortable conversations with people they don't know who are randomly walking into a coffee shop and being like, I'd like my latte. <laughs> <laughs> right? Didn't go well, but his heart was in the right place, right? He was like, it's the right thing to do. We need to do something. We should be talking about race. True, true, and true. <laughs> but there was no strategy for how to do it. So this is why I say, please, before you just go off and do something, let's think about what you're doing, why you're doing it, who you're doing it for, how are they going to be impacted, right? And think through those things, because then when you actually get to an action, it's going to be something that was well thought out, that people can buy into and support, and that can then be sustainable. But this is why we got into a place where we have no sustainability. In fact, I was reading a report by Josh, uh, Josh Burson, and uh, he was saying something that I have said for years, but I've never actually said out loud because I've been scared to say it. And I was like, thank you, Josh, for saying this, because now I can go, I can double down on this. <laughs> and what he said was that if you look at all the diversity um, uh, statistics, not even statistics, but the diversity reports, right? You've got Diversity Inc. and Great Place to Work and Fortune 500 lists and all these different lists, right? He's like, they don't use the same criteria to come up with who should be on that list. If you're talking about diversity, right, what's a great company for diversity if 
Amazon, I'm just picking them, right? I don't know what list they're on. But if Amazon is on that list, right, they should be on every single list because it means they're doing diversity right. And I, it's a whole thing about doing diversity right. We have a conversation about that. But I'm just saying, if they're using criteria, their criteria should be the same. So across the board, if you were supposed to be an advocate for diversity as a company that is being lauded as being great at it, you should be on all the lists. But when he compared them, you get one company that's on th two lists, two companies that are on one list, right? None of them are on there across the board, which shows that we need standards. We need proper standards to be able to demonstrate what diversity should look like, right, within a workplace. And once you have that, then you can have progress. But this is why we say diversity doesn't work, which also pisses me off, sorry. But <laughs> it's like, <laughs> Yeah, diversity doesn't work because what are you measuring it against, right? So when we go into companies, that's why we start with an audit process, we start with the awareness, right, is then you have a framework to start from and to measure from. You can figure out where are we today and where are we going? And then you have something to work off of. But if you're just randomly going, Stacy, come in and talk to me, talk to my talent acquisition, uh, talent acquisition team or come in and do unconscious bias training. Again, I can take your money, I'm happy to do that, but it's not going to do get the impact, right? And our mission vision is about making impact, not just making money. So if I can't do both, then I'm not interested. Well, and I feel like, you know, in terms of rushing to action and, you know, someone coming to you being like, do this training for me. And you're like, does this training even make sense? Like, you know, let, let's take our time a little bit. That's why I think the book is going to be so great because the book is such a nice, way to start. I feel like you're reading it on your own. You're having time to think. And then you're saying like, is this something that we need to bring somebody in? Or is this, you know, again, if, if you're not in a management position or a leadership position, is this somewhere I want to be, you know, or do, or do I need to switch jobs to find somewhere that's more fitting? And I think that that sort of self ownership is also really important as opposed to, you know, oh, my HR team's gonna take care of this or, oh, the diversity team or, oh, Stacy's gonna come in with her magic wand and, and fix everything. It's like- Wands in the shop. What? <laughs> wands in the shop. Harry Potter wand in the shop, broken, looking for a new one. It's like, there has to be some like self work. Right. And I think and as individuals, you can start, right? We can do ground up work, right? So I have talked to teams that have said, look, I don't know what our HR department is doing. Our CEO has his head in the sand, but as a team, we want to do some work, right? And they're just starting with their team. But once you start with your team, it starts to trickle to other places, right? You can have impact. So I think that's the other thing I wanna get across to people is please don't say, oh, woe well, is me, there's nothing I can do, right? Like, we are not uh, damsels in distress in a fairy tale. <laughs> there are things that you can do, right? You can treat your coworkers better. You can learn who your coworkers are um, and get to know them. You can include more people on your teams when you're deciding who gets to be on the project, who's getting resources for that project, who gets to be the team lead, right? who gets the opportunities, you can do those things. Um, and those are things you can do today, right? You're about to go to another Zoom meeting soon that's gonna have a bunch of people in it. You can make those changes today. So that's, I think, the number one thing I try to get across to people is we all can make a difference. And if we all do that, we're going to get to the place we need to get to. I could not agree more. And exactly what Jeff said as well, you know, like it starts at the team level, like it starts at the individual level, because I also think the whole like, oh, my boss will fix it or oh, a consultant, like it's sort of like someone else is going to give you the six pack, right? Like you have to do the burpees, you have to do the push ups, like you're not going to wake up magically one day and have a six pack or else we would probably all have six packs. I know. I'm struggling with my own. I looked at my arms the other day and I was like, oh, I need to work out. <laughs> Listen, we all, I feel like it's quarantine. It's been a year. We all just get a pass. It's a mulligan, like in golf. We all just, it's a free round of golf. Like it's a free mulligan. We all just get a pass, if you ask me. 
I think. I'm curious for someone that does, well, in your past, like doing, you know, more of the individual coaching and now working with teams and whatnot. I'm curious, since you're in a leadership position all the time, leading other people through work or through discomfort, do you yourself ever have a business coach or a business mentor or somebody that you go to. I'm always fascinated of like the coaches, if the coaches have coaches, yes. or how do the coaches get coached? Well, it's so funny that you asked that. Um, yes, I um, and actually, I just posted today, uh, Simply Diversity. So if you are not subscribed to my newsletter, you can go to simplydiversity.com and subscribe. Um, and so just this morning I posted, um, I was talking about this that like I ended up um, going to I went to a business coach right um, because the sense of urgency is what is underlying a lot of our, our unconscious bias right and our decision making. So we make this when we make decisions in a rush or when we're tired or you know when we're stressed that's where we fall back into these bad habits. And I am such a person who's always like, go, 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 we need this done now. We should have done it yesterday. Why isn't this done already? Hello, could you move faster, <laughs> right? And I realized that I'm counseling others to slow down a little bit and to really think, but yet I'm operating at this speed this, with this sense of urgency. And so working with my business coach, she really helped me to be like, okay, bring it down a notch. The world will not end if this doesn't happen in this, you know, this time frame that you have put out. And it's like, you're the one that's creating these timelines. Extend them a little. Why did you make this timeline so short? I'm like, well, because I wanted it done. <laughs> right? exactly. But that's the thing. And so that's the same thing I'm teaching and I have been teaching for many years to others, but then it's like physician heal thyself, right? So I had to learn as well that I need to bring it down and because that helps my team, right? Because I have this sense of urgency and then I'm making them move faster and then they're moving too fast and they're making mistakes. And so they're all happier. Like even everyone says, you seem so much calmer, Stacey. And it's like, yeah, because I've taken out this sense of urgency and it's helped to, um, to just put some more stability into things. I, I feel like in the rush of all of us to get back to normal, to take action, it is, it's, it's a hard pill to swallow when the medicine is not to rush. It's like getting over a breakup. You're like, I just want to be over this person already. And it's like, no, you just have to sit in the red wine and cookie dough phase until you like get out of the breakup. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm super excited for like this segment where I get to just free ask and like copy all your homework. And we all get to copy your homework with these like quick hits of like Stacy genius nuggets. So are you ready? Sure. <laughs> yes. Okay. Love it. What have you started using or doing lately that you are obsessed with that you're just like, whether it's this app or this thing I bought or whatever that you're like, this is changing my life right now. Um, so I, I think for me, it's probably monday.com. That's my new thing. Um, because again, my business coach was like, Stacy, um, you need to not only slow down, but like, where is your stuff written down? She's like, where, where? And I was like, well, I have a post-it note and I have an Excel spreadsheet and I have my notebook and I have, she's just like, mm -mm -mm. <laughs> <laughs> when that happens, right? When they end up being right, you're like, you got me. Yeah. And so, but it's, it's been a journey. I have been spending over a year trying to find the right thing because my brain moves really quickly. I need stuff done and I needed something that was intuitive and that would move and where I could move things around the way that my brain thinks. And so monday.com has been helpful because I can throw stuff onto a board and I can move them. It's like, Oh, move this one to here. Oh, no, nope, move it back. And like literally that happened the other day. I had a client who was like, Oh, I need you to come in to do this particular consulting engagement. And they were like, Oh, well, we actually want you to also do the speaking engagement. So I'm like, okay, then that gets moved to this over here. So I was just able to just with a swipe, just move it. And like, that's what I needed was something that doesn't require a whole lot of effort that will move as quickly as I do. <laughs> so. 
which is big, really big. Yes. At least for organizational purposes, which if you're trying to move fast is super important. Yes. So I get it. What is the best gift that you've given yourself this year? Because I feel like, again, in COVID, it's been like weird and you're probably giving so much time to other people and like your friends and your family that sometimes you like forget about you. So have yeah. you done something for yourself in the past year that was particularly helpful? I have. I have given up the idea that I have to be like a good homemaker in order to be a good mom. <laughs> it's just like, I've totally given that up. And it's so freeing because I have three daughters and I was like, you know what? I don't have to do everything. I don't have to cook everything. I don't have to be here for everything. I don't have to answer all of your questions. I am not Google. And so I have just freed myself from that. And it's so funny because my kids, you know, they'll ask me a question and, and I'm like, hmm. And they literally just stop and go, well, what, what do you mean you don't know? Go find out. <laughs> and they just are like, well, but you're supposed, well, it's just easier to ask you. Yeah, I know it is. And now you can go find out. And it is just, it's been so crazy in my house. Like the other day it was like, we don't have dinner. Really? So none of y'all decided to cook? No, nobody thought about taking something out? Oh, guess we don't have dinner. Um, we got bread. Do you want to make grilled cheese? I don't know. Make something to eat, <laughs> right? So just to just take that weight off of me because I have just been carrying that. And I'm like, I'm tired. I'm trying to run a business. I'm working late, you know, early in the morning to late at night. And then I'm supposed to cook too? I'm like, feed thyself. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like it's huge when, and I'm still learning it and I sort of fall back into my old habits and I have to like work at it, but delegating, like I have, I am naturally not a good delegator, but I have to actively work. And when I feel myself starting to go back, I have to like, you know, crank it back up again. But yeah, delegating is a huge gift that you can give yourself. Massive. Yeah. Huge. Okay, what is the next thing that you are really hoping to learn? Not that you have a ton of free time, especially with the book coming out, but is there anything maybe then that you either learned recently or that you're excited to learn maybe after the book comes out when you like get some more free time? Yeah, I mean, for me, I want to really expand um, on my knowledge in this area. And one of the things I really want to work on is learning more about the human brain. I've been reading these studies about how, you know, the science behind DEI. And I think it's also because part of that I want to be able to um, really, you know, I shouldn't pay attention to the trolls, but I can't help it because I'm always like, but if you just give them the right answer, you know, <laughs> maybe they'll they'll get there. And the, the logical side of my brain understands that that's not true. Um, but I still, I really, I, I realize that there is such a science, right, behind um, belonging and the science behind empathy and just all these different things. And I really wanna learn more about that. And so one of the consultants I work with, she's um, in a, a master's course right now on this whole journey. So I'm probably gonna be doing some more work with her to learn. I'm like, I can't wait. I'm like, teach me what you know. <laughs> teach me what you know, I know. It's hard, to, it's hard to drown out the trolls, but what I've tried to do recently with a lot of my feeds, whether that's my LinkedIn feed my Instagram feed or really just any social media platform feed is really unfollowing, unlinking, unconnecting, whatever you, un, you want to use, um, but sort of getting rid of anyone that, you know, might be a little more negative energy or makes me feel, uh, you know, less than. And so I'm, I'm sort of always looking for accounts that you know, really are like a spark or, you know, positive people. And so I'm curious, are there like a handful of people that you follow on LinkedIn or maybe it's another social platform that you're just like, oh, like they pop up in your feed and you're just like, yes, like that is like, who are those people? Yeah. Um, so my my current girl crush is uh, Rachel Rogers. <laughs> I love her. So I learned about her actually through a friend of mine a couple of years ago um, 
And she said, oh, you really need to know Rachel Rogers. You need to go to one of her mastermind groups. And I was like, oh, I don't have time for that, right? Um, but then I read, oh, gosh, I think last year that like she made a million dollars in a month or something like that. And I was like, hello, wait, what? This is the same chick I was supposed to be following. Let me go check her out. <laughs> so, um, so her company is Hello7 and she has this club called We Should All Be Millionaires. And I joined her club and I love it, love it, love it, love it, love it. And delegating is one of the things. We literally have seven daily habits. One of them is delegate something new every day. And so I'm just like delegating stuff left and right. You do this. You take this. Yeah, I don't want to do this. <laughs> okay, that sounds like a club I definitely need to check out. So I will be Googling that <laughs> immediately when we end this. That is yes. for sure. Yes. And then there's um, it's the head of diversity and inclusion at oh gosh is it um i'm gonna get it wrong hold on it's the head of diversity and inclusion at adidas um asif sadiq he always on linkedin always seems to have like the best um dei articles i'm like who is your marketing team and where do you find these articles and i just want you to know sometimes i steal some of them and repost them so <laughs> but I love the stuff that he posts. And so I'm always uh, looking at, at what he's posting and it's always really informative. So it's great. Ooh, that's a good one. I, speaking of Adidas or, you know, when, when your magic wand gets out of the shop, because we all know you have one, obviously, but when your magic wand gets out of the shop and, you know, you look at Adidas or any of these big, 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 massive companies that, you know, you work with or that know about, if you could wave your magic wand and be like, I wish that every single company would fix this or would change this one thing. Like, what would be the one thing that you would change about every, I guess not even just big company, just maybe just company in general? I would love uh, if companies would go back to, and I don't know if they ever really did this, but I feel like we've been told that they did where they had like on the job training programs. And I feel like we need to get back to that. We need companies to stop expecting people to show up knowing everything and then being frustrated when they don't. <laughs> it's like, I haven't worked for your company before. Hello, um, can I get a little bit of a training? Can we get some proper onboarding? And not just onboarding, but really, letting people learn on the job. There are so many people who can, they can do the job, right? They've got the, the ability, the capacity, right? They can learn. We are humans, we can do all kinds of stuff. And we just don't give people an opportunity to, um, to get into their zone of genius. It's like, you were in this box, you will stay in that box. You do not get to leap from box to box. Keep your box over there, don't let it touch my box, <laughs> right? And <laughs> I just, it drives me insane. And I really, really, really wish that companies would get out of that line of thinking and help people to, uh, to really, you know, um, use their brain to the best of their ability. I, I feel like that's so true. It's, you really are expected to know first thing, like what you're supposed to be doing. And, and most of the time, I would say 99% of the time, people don't. Right. So oh, I would love some of that. Um, okay, what is one homework assignment that you would give each of us to do this week? It could be listen to a certain podcast. It could be, you know, take a walk outside, whatever it is. I will cheat and give one for you, which is everyone should go pre-order your book. I yes. cannot shamelessly plug that one enough, but what would you say is like a good homework assignment for people this week? Uh, yes, so um, I will plug the book, which I said it's right there, Unbiased, Addressing Unconscious Bias at Work. Buy it, buy one for a friend, buy one for your leadership team. You can anonymously just like send it to them. <laughs> Um, but I think that the, the homework really is get to know somebody new, right? And not even somebody new, right? Get to know somebody on your team who you don't normally talk to. I don't even need you to go out and find someone new. There is somebody right next to you. And I say virtually next to you. Some of you might still be in person because um, we've heard that Texas is reopening. 
Um, but <laughs> you can <laughs> you can get to know somebody on a slightly deeper level. Again, not talking about learning their intimate secrets, but just who are they as a person, right? And getting to know them a little bit more because creating a relationship with your coworkers is going to help you to have better teams, make better decisions, and to trust each other. And it's just gonna it's gonna make life a lot better for everybody. Yeah, it's just gonna make everybody's life more rich. And we all going back to everybody being millionaires, like we all need a little more richness in our life. So, uh, Stacey, you have been amazing. Thank you so much. Where can people keep learning from you? I know there's a zillion social platforms. So like what are one or two that you spend the most time on? Um, I spend the most time on LinkedIn. Um, so LinkedIn is easy. It's LinkedIn slash in slash Stacey Gordon. Um, so you can find me there. But yeah, anything, all the rework work uh, channels are available on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter. And uh, you find me at reworkwork.com. Like if you could just Google me and I'll pop up. <laughs> oh, I love it. You are absolutely the best. Thank you so much for taking time to talk with us today. So, so appreciate you being here. Thank you. Thank you. I enjoyed the conversation. Awesome. Well, everybody connect with Stacy, And obviously, as I say every week, have a great week, meet someone new or talk to a coworker a little bit more, whatever it is, connect with everybody here and with Stacy because we know that she reads eventually every single connection request. So thank you everybody for being here and have a great rest of the week. Thanks. Bye. Bye.